We are now entering the final month of 2019, and not only that, we're entering the final month of the decade of the 2010s. I want to take a look back at the 10 most significant trades of the past decade. We'll get into all that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we're about to finish off another decade here, and we've had all kinds of NHL history made over the past 10 years. And today I want to take a look back at the 10 most significant trades, in my opinion, over the past decade. Of course, as always, as we go through these, I want to know what your comments down in the comment section and how much of an impact these trades had. And if you feel there are any other trades that should be on this list, make sure you leave some comments on that as well. Now let's dive in here and get started with the top 10 trades. Number 10, we're going to kick things off with Russian superstar Ilya Kovalchuk being traded from the Atlanta Thrashers over to the New Jersey Devils. This trade took place on February the 4th, 2010, with the Thrashers trading their captain along with Ansi Salmela in a second round pick over to New Jersey in exchange for defenseman Johnny Oduya, Nicholas Bergforce, Patrice Cormier, a first and second round pick. Now, based on the results here, it doesn't look like the uh, Devils really had to give up a whole heck of a lot to acquire a top talent in Ilya Kovalchuk. It was pretty clear to the Thrashers that Kovalchuk would not be returning after numerous attempts at signing their superstar and their captain to a long-term extension. They decided to make the deal rather than risk losing him for nothing through free agency. Of course, Kovalchuk later went on to sign a $100 million contract with the Devils, which was originally rejected by the league and had to be reworked before being accepted. Of course, as we know, Ilya Kovalchuk later bolted for the KHL and left a lot of money on the table in the process. Number 9. The San Jose Sharks acquired defenseman Brent Burns from the Minnesota Wild. Now, along with Brent Burns was included as a second round pick, which they used to select Pontus Aberg. Now, as we know, Aberg's bounced around the NHL quite a bit during his time in the league. The Minnesota Wild received Charlie Coyle, Devin Setaguchi in a first round pick, which they used to select Zach Phillips. Now, of course, Charlie Coyle had some very productive years with the Wild before being traded to the Bruins last year at the deadline. And, of course, Devin Setaguchi, unfortunately, bounced around, battled a lot of personal issues as well, never really was able to duplicate his success he had uh, being a one-time 50-goal scorer with the San Jose Sharks, playing a lot with top center Joe Thornton in that time. So a great trade for the San Jose Sharks. They picked up the rover, Brent Burns, who was basically going back and forth between being a forward and a defenseman with the Wild, who was a steady blue liner, a Norris Trophy winner, and really helped mold that blue line for many years to come. Number 8, the Vancouver Canucks goaltender situation, which was very complicated for an extended period of time with Roberto Luongo and Corey Schneider, with the expectation one would be traded, but not both. Uh, ends up seeing the Vancouver Canucks trade Luongo, along with Stephen Anthony, to the Florida Panthers in exchange for goaltender Jacob Markstrom and forward Sean Mathias. Now, of course, as we know, Luongo went on to have some pretty productive years and then wound down and ended up retiring with the Panthers. Markstrom's been a pretty decent starter for the Canucks as of recently, especially the last few years. Of course, Stephen Anthony never really worked out to be a player for the Panthers. And Sean Mathias was mediocre at best for a short stint in Vancouver, but certainly the goaltending situation, which we expected to see one goaltender, but not two, end up being traded here. Now, there were so many big deals in the past decade, it was hard to narrow it down to just 10, so we actually have a tie for 8th, considering the Canucks trade up both their star goaltenders. So we have this deal here of the New Jersey Devils acquiring Corey Schneider at the NHL draft from the Vancouver Canucks in exchange for their first round pick, which the Canucks then drafted Bo Horvat with, who's now their captain and one of their top players. Of course, Corey Schneider went on to have some productive years with New Jersey, but lately in the last few years has battled a lot of injuries and now finds himself in the minors after recently going through waivers. So his career is certainly trajected downward for the most part uh, during his time in New Jersey, but originally the first couple of years were not too bad for Schneider in New Jersey. But as I said, we did not expect the Vancouver Canucks to be treating Luongo and Schneider. Both, we expected one of them to stay and be their longtime goaltender of the future. The Canucks certainly surprised everybody by trading both these guys within a short span. Number seven was a big day for the Philadelphia Flyers organization and transformed their franchise for the better part of this decade. June 23rd, 2011, the Philadelphia Flyers trade Jeff Carter 
to the Columbus Blue Jackets in return for forward Jake Voracek and two draft picks, which are then used to select Sean Couturier and Nick Cousins. Now, of course, the Flyers earlier in that day had traded other top forward Mike Richards over to the Los Angeles Kings. Of course, Jeff Carter didn't really stay in Columbus too long. It really wasn't all that long later. He was later traded to L.A. to reunite with Mike Richards, but they went on to win some Stanley Cups together because both those two guys were expected to be two big players for the Flyers for many years to come for the better part of this decade. But, of course, the Flyers decided they needed to transform their franchise. Of course, both were having concerns with a lot of partying and things like that going on with the Flyers organization. And, of course, Paul Holmgren decided to really change things up. Of course, uh, it's hard to say now if they regret making those moves or not. Even though Jeff Carter went on to have a lot of success in L.A., I think it's safe to say right now that Jake Voracek and Sean Couturier are huge parts of their franchise here as well. But certainly a franchise-altering day for the Flyers. Number 6. The Toronto Maple Leafs trade Phil Kessel to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Of course, by this point, the Toronto Maple Leafs were in the process of trying to bottom out and really accelerate their rebuild. Phil Kessel was one of the top big names, productive players that were left to be moved. And the trade took place, sending Phil Kessel along with Erickson, Biggs, and a second round pick over to the Pittsburgh Penguins in exchange for Kasperi Kapanen, Nick Spalling, Scott Harrington, and a first round pick, which turned out to be Sam Steele. But of course, that pick was later traded to the Anaheim Ducks when they were able to acquire goaltender Frederick Anderson. Now, of course, Phil Kessel went on to have some very productive years in Pittsburgh, collecting a couple of Stanley Cups along the way. Of course, he has since been traded to the Arizona Coyotes. And, of course, the Leafs got at least some prospects, mainly Kasperi Kapanen is the main piece going back, who will should hopefully be a part of their team for some time. But that was a huge trade and a big part of the Toronto Maple Leafs rebuild that let them to be more successful as they are today. Number five, the Boston Bruins trade emerging young forward and former number two overall pick Tyler Sagan to the Dallas Stars. Of course, this was a huge trade for both clubs. The Boston Bruins end up trading Sagan along with Rich Peverly over to the Bruins in exchange for Louis Erickson, who had some productive years with the Dallas Stars organization. They also acquired Riley Smith and a couple defensemen in Joe Morrow and Matt Frazier. Now, of course, Erickson went on to have some very productive years as well with the Boston Bruins before uh, leaving via free agency and eventually signing with the Canucks. Of course, we know how that ended up. Things are not great with Erickson in Vancouver right now. Tyler Sagan went on to have some uh, mega years with Dallas, including some very productive years, signed a mega long-term deal, and has really formed a great one-two punch for the most part uh, with Stars captain and top winger Jamie Benn. Of course, things are a little bit different right now. Dallas has re-emerged after some struggling times earlier this year, but Tyler Sagan has gone on to be a cornerstone piece of the Stars franchise. Number four, the Buffalo Sabres trade forward Ryan O'Reilly to the St. Louis Blues. Now, we all know how this ended up. Ryan O'Reilly ended the season with Buffalo the year before and basically said that he lost his desire to play hockey. He could not play in that type of environment, a losing a culture that the Sabres had been festering in for many years. And it sounded like he definitely wanted out and the Sabres obliged with an offseason trade, sending him over to the Blues. Now the Sabres in return got a couple of forwards in Patrick Berglund, Vladimir Sapoka, along with youngster Tage Thompson, and a first and second round pick. Now, I think we all know how this one worked out as well. Even though the Blues started off really slow last year, Ryan O'Reilly's first full year with the St. Louis Blues led them all the way to the Stanley Cup, and Ryan O'Reilly taking home plenty of hardware in the process, not only a Stanley Cup, but a Conn Smythe Trophy, a Selkie Trophy. Uh, Ryan O'Reilly really did it all last year and proved that he really is one of the game's top players while putting up lots of great offensive numbers as well. So that trade worked out to be huge for the St. Louis Blues. Meanwhile, if you take a look at all these players, Patrick Berglund later walked away from the Buffalo Sabres um, and basically quit playing hockey. Uh, Vladimir Saboka is really a fringe forward at best. Thompson really hasn't established himself as of yet. So the Sabres, as of right now at least, really don't have much to show for for this trade. And the St. Louis Blues, meanwhile, have a Stanley Cup. Number three, the Edmonton Oilers trade former first overall draft pick Taylor Hall, 1-4-1 one one, to the New Jersey Devils for defenseman 
Adam Larson, who in his own right was also a high draft pick, but certainly not a top defenseman at this point in time. Adam Larson basically is at best a second or third pair defenseman. Meanwhile, Taylor Hall went on to have some incredible years so far with New Jersey, including a Hart Trophy season where he absolutely tore up the NHL as one of the top players. Of course, Adam Larson is still a productive defenseman you know, you know, and a player that the Oilers can certainly use back there in the blue line, but this is a very lopsided trade in my opinion. One of the black marks on GM Peter Chiarelli's time with the Edmonton Oilers. I think if they had a chance to do a do-over, that they certainly would do so. Uh, clearly, uh, at this point, I think the Oilers would be interested in re-signing Taylor Hall should he give them an opportunity to, if he hits free agency next summer. But this is one of the worst trades, in my opinion, for the Oilers in the past decade. Number two, saw a huge one-for-one one trade between the Predators and the Blue Jackets with the Columbus Blue Jackets acquiring stud defenseman Seth Jones from Nashville in exchange for top center iceman Ryan Johansson. Now, prior to this, Ryan Johansson had a bit of a contract standoff with Columbus, had a really hard time coming to terms, and it was later determined that both of them could benefit from a fresh start here. They're both pretty young at the time, both had a ton of potential, and both teams saw the uh, possibility here of, of acquiring a top player for their franchise. Of course, Nashville saw the opportunity to grab a top center Iceman. They had lots of depth on defense. Uh, so Seth Jones kind of seemed expendable at the time. Of course, he's since gone on to become one of the most underrated but yet top defensemen around the NHL. He really is that stud D that many thought he would be when he was drafted and has been a cornerstone for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Meanwhile, Ryan Johansson signed a mega long-term deal with the Predators, $8 million per year. And even though he has been a top player for the Predators, he's not quite as productive, in my opinion, as he should be for that type of contract. Number one, the huge trade we saw between the Montreal Canadiens and Nashville Predators swapping defensemen at very different stages of their career. The Montreal Canadiens acquire former Predators captain Shea Weber in exchange for young defenseman P.K. Subban, who had previously won a Norris Trophy. This was a trade that sent shockwaves through the NHL, a massive thing that nobody really saw coming. It wasn't a huge surprise that Montreal traded P.K. Subban. There was a lot of talk, a lot of rumors leading up to his departure from Montreal. It was well known that he had internal issues with other players on the team and that basically his personality it looks like it had grown too big for the team and the franchise and the city and just wasn't working out there. Uh, so, but, but there was a lot of people who criticized this trade with Shea Weber having such a long-term expensive contract, being a little bit older as well. But as we know so far, the Nashville Predators have since traded Subban over to New Jersey. Meanwhile, Shea Weber has stayed with Montreal, battled through some injuries, but overall been very productive and is now their team captain. And overall, I must say that deal worked out better for Montreal than many have predicted in the end here. But of course, there's still a lot of time left on that contract. It still might be a little bit early yet to say who exactly won that deal. But considering that Weber's still with Montreal, wearing the C, and Subban's no longer with the Predators, right now we're leaning towards Montreal winning that deal, at least in my opinion. So as we begin to get ready for a new decade here starting in 2020, of course we have the first NHL trade deadline coming up not too far away in a few months time in February 2020. Let me know which players you think are going to be involved in some of the biggest, most huge trades we're going to see uh, for the next decade and they're going to alter some other different teams, franchises for the years to come. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section and we'll continue the conversation. Of course, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe before you go as well. We post content here every day, lots of great hockey talk, and we look forward to seeing you next time.